so. Website. Today. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> Starting soon, yes. It should be starting now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This could be maybe a refresh for some of these. It's not good either, huh? An error occurred. All right, one more time. It's odd. Well, the point is that whether or not this is working um, live, no one would be streaming it anyways because nobody knew about it. But the way it works is it records. Does anyone out here do a Google Hangout? Google, Hang Google Hangouts on air, and uh, what it does is YouTube records it and then puts it on YouTube right now. So hopefully this will work. It's also, I'm, I've never had it a problem. I've done this for years. Not for years. For a year now. And uh, it always works. Not now, though. You know, I can embed it in the streams. You got embedded it, Rob. Oh, wow. So it'll be recorded this way instead of with the camera. Um, so here's the uh, schedule that you can't read, but it's um, week three. Presentation itself. Irving, Goff Irving Goffman. This is um, my, one of my favorites. Um, hopefully you all read it. I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that. So without further ado, slides. How many slides? I think there are 35. Hmm. Maybe next time I'll shut the window. Looking at my own. This will be a great video. A lot of me doing this. So, week three. Um, lecture by me. Images used with permission, so I can sell this. Yeah, I can put ads on them. Get tremendously rich. We're in week three. There are uh, 16 weeks. 16 weeks. So the end of the third week. We got a day off though. Apply their time to a minute. What'd you do on your uh, day off? Left. Oh, you studied class? Morning class is still left. Well, where are we? Keeping up with the progress, starting with a little bit of logistics. Where have we been? One quiz. I think everyone was here for that except for Joseph Perry. Is Joseph here this time? Oh, you're here. You Joseph. Glad you're here. I recognize you, just didn't get to see you last week. We have one quiz, two points. There are 100 points for the class. As indicated on the syllabus, we have one paper, which is due today. If you are brought the papers. We ask and review about those fine papers that you wrote and brought to class today. We're 10 points. So if you didn't do the quiz, you have the most you can get is 98. If you didn't do a paper, the most you can get is 90. If you didn't do both, most you can get is 88. Not a math major. So we have a lot more quizzes and a lot more papers. And no, not a lot more. Only one more paper, but three exams. And it all adds up to 100 points. Base 10 system makes it easy to keep track. Um, at this point, you all just get the two points for doing the quiz or being in class, and um, probably give you the 10 points just for doing the paper. So. Um, Hopefully you did that. Um, what did we learn? We learned a little bit about what is sociology and how uh, the sociological imagination um, 
can can be used to um, look at our experiences. We have multiple different perspectives which we kind of analyze through cultural relativism theory. We have normalized behavior. Well, we may do that's normal. Uh, somebody else might think is crazy. I give you the example of me getting a speeding ticket. What I thought was normal speed, uh, someone else thought was um, worth a sanction of one hundred and thirty-five dollars and three points um, on my record. So I'm going to fight it, right? Um, no organized. Protests or sit in like the old students did, but um, when I do something that I believe is, should be normalized, I'm going to at least let somebody else know that I think it's uh, normal behavior and try not to be such a deviant. Um, more keeping up with the progress in our logistics. Um, how do I know what to do in this class? Well, you read the syllabus for one, um, or the syllabus on the website. They're the same. And I'll probably make more updates to the website. As I've indicated here, changes are possible. And this week, the syllabus said, read the Goffman chapter. Um, there are topics for the week on the syllabus. There are chapters indicated on the syllabus. It's like the most right column and pre presenters are listed. We went over that. I sent you emails. Who's presenting when? Um, I'm presenting this week, obviously. And uh, when the items are due is also on the syllabus. This computer has a screensaver. Incredibly annoying, and I can't shut it off. So ho hopefully it doesn't uh, cause the screen to go blue too frequently. I hope the transitions still work too. Once a minute, or once a minute, it's like one. It'll be a long semester. What are we doing this week? So the syllabus said we're going to uh, be looking at Gotham and presentation of self. That's going to be chapter 12 in my Henslin book. I don't know if you have a different edition. Um, you have the book, uh, Mr. Perry. What chapter is the Goffman chapter? Can you look in the table of contents and tell us? As the syllabus indicates, I'm the presenter today, and item D is book. Um, on my uh, web, what chapter? In, in second chapter, and it's the 12th in my edition, so they wised up. You know, I probably have an old one. They wised up, and they decided to move it to front. That's good for you because it, it makes logical sense for Goffman to be during the front of the um, semester um, because it's easy to read and it's about our everyday interactions. Of one, this uh, picture is a good example on page 201 in my book, so the pages are going to be up. Uh, it's chapter 2 for Goffman chapter. It, uh, in, it, it talks right from the get-go about giving high fives. So presentation of self, I'm presenting myself right now. We're all presenting ourselves like actors on the stage. In this photo, we have these two guys giving each other a high five, and that's directly in the text. So what are these guys doing? How does this guy know to put his hand up? Because the other guy put his hand up. How does this guy know not to shoot that guy? Easy question. Well, it's illegal. Well, so I mean, like you don't shoot the guy on your own team, and we all know what a high five is. So there are indicators of how we should interact socially. Um, somebody puts their hand up for a high five, you give them a high five. There's no law that says that. There's no rule book. You don't get paid. It's not incentivized. But we all know how to behave and how to interact based on these visual or verbal cues. Irving Goffman, uh, his theory is kind of referred to as dramaturgy or dramaturgy, Dra drama, just like you have on TV, turgy, I have no idea what it means. Presentation of self, look at dramaturgy, however you say it, and think drama, like we're all actors on a stage. I'm acting, you're an audience. When any person comes into the presence of others, that person seeks to acquire information, like the guy put his hand up, I acquired that information, on how to act, and I use prior knowledge, oh, and the guy puts his hand up, I'm supposed to give him a high five about how to act. So what does that mean? How does How is that a sociological model? Well, I have this in yellow here, any person. So when Goffman's talking about any person, what he's doing is he's saying, this, these guys give each other high fives. I'm going to use that as a model. Not that everybody gives each other high fives, but those visual cues that are in the high five, guy puts his hand up, other guy knows what to do using his prior history and his current situation. That's a model for all of our behavior. So the high five with the visual cues is a model for everybody's behavior. That's when he says any person or implies that that behavior can be replicated. That's a model for all behavior. 
So here we have sign vehicles, which are in your text. Um, visual cues. How do you know what to do in this situation? How do you know who that person is? Uniform. Uniform. What else? Yes, the equipment and the uniform. And they're behind, so the position. Like if they're in front of the equipment, being the cash register, they would be who? Yeah. Customer. And they would have on a different uniform, right? They would be dressed like not in a McDonald's uniform. So the uniform for a customer is more varied. Well, the text also says that we have intentional and unintentional expressions. Um, her, what was some of her intentional expression? Even the uniform is intentional. She purposely put on a uniform. That's an intentional expression. But in this case, in this picture, as you are, as you, I heard some of you say, what's an intentional sign in this picture? The smile. But when I put this picture up here, I put it up there on purpose because is a smile always intentional? You always purposefully smile on cue, right? You don't always, right? If somebody tells a joke, some people don't laugh. Other people crack up. That's almost like a subconscious reaction. So sometimes a smile can be on purpose and sometimes maybe not. The uniform is typically on purpose, although we'll, we'll discuss whether or not even putting on a uniform <laughs> is intentional. It's highly important for us to realize that we do not always lead our lives or make our decisions. We live by inference. So uh, why did that girl put on her uniform? She was told to, her boss told her to. She wanted to, she wanted to make money. Um, so it's not necessarily that she was born wanting to wear a McDonald's uniform. Um, we live our lives by other factors. And as I mentioned with the joke telling um, and the laughing, you know, we are we make inferences. If you say a joke, even though even if I don't think it's funny, I might laugh because I know that it's socially acceptable to laugh. I think sometimes in this class, <laughs> you all laugh at me just to patronize me and get in my good graces. Um, so you're you're living your lives, you're behaving out of inferences about what you're supposed to do rather than what might be natural. You're all wearing clothes, okay? If it was 80, 90 degrees out, you know, why do you wear clothes? It's kind of inferred that that's appropriate, right? So who are you? Are you yourself or are you just the person that others perceive, perceive you to be or are you just the person that others tell you to be? So what in the text, what, what makes a person popular? What makes you normal? You dress normally. In the text, what makes someone popular? Well, in the text it was, how many phone calls someone gets in a dorm? In the back in the day, you see a paged overhead. So nowadays, it's not how many phone calls you get in a dorm. Maybe it's just how many phone calls you get on your cell phone in a dorm. So if you're all living in a dorm on one floor, and, and a girl has uh, guys calling her all the time, or friends calling her all the time, she's super popular. So that popularity is socially constructed. She was not born popular. Popularity is correlated with how many phone calls that girl gets. That's from the text. How many phone calls in the dorm someone gets? So, perceived behavior. You know I love to bring in pop culture to the mix. And here we have um, a football player who was in the news this week. Sometimes the traditions, this is a quote from your text, sometimes the traditions of an individual's role will lead him to give a well-designed impression of a particular kind, yet he may be neither consciously or unconsciously disposed to create such an impression. Your two key vocabulary words are in white, traditions and roles. Can anyone tell me how this guy, what, what his role is? What's his role? What's his social role? He's an athlete. He's an athlete. What else? He's a role model. Sure. Some might say he's a role model. What else? I'm not supposed to be an athlete. He's supposed to have respect and sportsmanship, maybe, because he's a professional athlete. But uh, his name is Richard Sherman, and he did something this week that was perceived by others. And people perceived things when they watched his interview on TV. 
and they reacted to it. Now, if you're all in your own homes, I have no idea how you all reacted to Richard Sherman, but we have social media now, so we can see how other people react to things that happen in real time. And we have two tweets here, one from Andre Iguodala, who's a professional basketball player. Um, when Richard Sherman did his interview, which you're just going to have to go home and watch, Andre says, we just got back set, we just got set back 500 years. Who is he referring to when he says we? Um, it might be athletes, it might be African Americans. The interviewer is Aaron Andrews, and Kayla says, Aaron Andrews looked petrified, and I don't blame her. So why would Kayla have that reaction? She might have been petrified. So she perceived fear in that situation, and she she put that on the situation, on Aaron Andrews. And why would Kayla, I don't know if you can see, but why would she feel that way, almost em empathetic to Aaron Andrews? Okay, I, she could be also an interviewer. She's definitely a white male. So how else was Richard Sherman perceived? Is any of these how he wanted to be perceived? There's a lot of blacked out stuff here because there's a lot of vulgar language. And it, it's, it's really sad. I'm not even going to read it to you so you can click on the slides and read it to yourself or you can go to Deadspin's, uh, Deadspin and read them. So with all of these very extremely, extremely vulgar responses to Richard Sherman's behavior, are these comments um, how he wanted to be perceived? Did he want to be perceived in all of those ridiculously vulgar ways? Probably not. Yet he was. Is it important, as a second question asked, those people's behavior? You might read those and say, those people are crazy. Is their behavior important? Why is it important? Could be economically important. Why else is it important? Think about sociology being individuals and groups. Why is that important? Yeah. It could. Maybe he's making something normal that other people don't like. Well, who says he's supposed to be known? I mean, that's what everyone perceives him. It's like James Winston tweeted after that. You know, he's great when after he did that. He's like, all these people are going to start hating on Richard Sherman just because uh, there's a script that people think he's supposed to be following. Mm -hmm. And remember that um, vocabulary word that's a tradition up there? Isn't this his culture? Culture is based out of tradition and performed behavior that's normal. And so. Richard Sherman's behavior kind of comes from his culture. And you can, you know, don't jump to say, by culture I mean African Americans or Compton or whatever. His culture is also from Stanford University, four years. He has a Stanford degree. So culture is defined, a very construct, constructive definition. Goffman, from your text, it would seem that an individual can more easily make a choice about what to do about the treatment to demand from and extend to the others present at the beginning of an encounter than he can alter the line of treatment that is being pursued once the interaction is underway. So this is saying that maybe a Richard Sherman can make the choice, or people can make the choice about how others are going to perceive them, more so at the beginning of the interaction than at the end. And it seemed to be true in the Richard Sherman case where the reaction afterwards was so much different than probably um, he could have controlled it. Controlled not being not being meaning that he did something bad, or but he could have controlled it differently. He could have possibly chosen to do something different. So other actors on stages are waitresses. The skilled waitress. This is from your text. Page will be different. Tackles the cu customer with confidence, without hesitation. What that saying is, if you are a waitress and you kind of laissez-faire approach a customer, the customer might think you're lazy or incompetent. But if you are a skilled waitress, perhaps you're going to come with gusto and a, a smiling, bubbly personality to the customer right from the bat, right from the get. You can get your good tips in right from the first impression. So the text talks a lot about first impressions. Now I want to hear a little bit about your interactions. You all wrote papers about your interactions, and I gave you some key points you could make about choices that you made in the interaction. Um, 
choices that the other person made, treatment, how you were treated, how they were treated, traditions, uh, maybe you have a different cultural tradition, um, roles that were involved in your interaction, decisions that were made, inferences, uh, and I was pulled over by the police officer, I had a lot of inferences, perceptions, I had those two assumptions, uh, sign vehicles, even though I'm talking about getting pulled over in a vehicle, sign vehicles are different. Those are our visual cues, like uniforms, pieces of equipment, and uh, even hand gestures. So I'll put that picture up there. And uh, the intentions of the actor. So I want to know more about your interaction and what you wrote on your paper. So tell me about that. Who wants to start? Go ahead. Um, well, I wrote about um, this weekend, um, my friend had a drink with birthday, so we went to Mount Pleasant and went to Boyside. They were all trashed and I was sober. I was DD and I'm in season, so, and I'm underage. But anyways, um, and so my behavior, I wrote it as my behavior was a deviant one because normally when you go to the club or you go out for the weekend, you do get drunk and go out and have a good time and all that, but my behavior was one because I stayed sober and just kind of took care of everybody. Um, so I wrote, so basically like the tradition would be going out and getting drunk and the breaking tradition was staying sober. And you even talked about your role, which was what? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Tradition to go out on your 21st birthday too. Yeah, that, that was definitely full of role, tradition, demons, assumptions. What else? Who else had a good experience interaction? <coughs> but okay. You never jump on your parents, do you? I mean, you don't tell them what to do, right? You don't say like, "Dad, dude, you only make sixty-five thousand a year. Get, get a new, get a second job, bro. All right, you, we need to make more money here. Work harder, like because that's not your role, right? How come your dad has a powerful role? It's all economics. And why, uh, why, your, why does your dad have more power than your mom, or does he? Yeah. <laughs> In 1955, who would have had more power? Yeah, probably, right? So gender has changed as far as power, both in families and in professional. Did anyone else have a gendered interaction? I gave you some specific ones you could base off of race, uh, finances, gender. Well, one thing, since we went up there on Friday night, it's ladies night, so ladies get in free, but all the guys had to pay. And my boyfriend paid, and the guy he gave him a twenty, and it was like six bucks. Or he gave him twenty-one dollars. It was six bucks to get in, and the guy only gave him back a five. And so my boyfriend sat there and argued with him because he's like, "Dude, you didn't give me enough change back." And so the big bouncer guy comes over and like was about ready to start something. He's like, "I just want my change back." Do you think it would have been a little less conflict if it was a female? Yeah, if it was me, I'm sure they would have been like, oh, my God. That's very interesting because conflict theory is one that we'll hopefully talk about later in the semester. Conflict theory, you know, that all of our social interactions are based on conflict. Not necessarily that we're actors on stage, but all of our interactions have conflict. And uh, typically, conflict is a lot of times based on our differences. Um, so, like in Richard Sherman, he was a black male, and Aaron Andrews was a white female, so they're so different that there is a high potential for conflict. But in your case, it's interesting that 
very the the two actors were very similar. Maybe they're both white males of the same age, yet there's a lot of conflict. Whereas if they're different, more different, there would have been less conflict. That's very interesting. We'll talk more about conflict here too. Anyone else have a gender? He gave age. He involved family. Anyone have a racial one or an education difference? But what were some of those perceptions and were they substantiated? And their perceptions were their stereotypes? Um, do they go to better schools, better, more prestigious I schools? These are both had work. Were there any big differences between those, or are you all the same? Yeah. Maybe you're all a lot alike because of your backgrounds, and you're all you all come from the same background. Your culture for the first 16, 17 years was so much the same. You can go to different environments and remain the same um, and not change that much. Uh, I had a I had a pretty in-depth discussion with the professor, the Spanish professor who was in here right before this class, mm -hmm. about assumptions and perceptions of schools. Um, I've taught at like five or six or more schools, and my assumptions and perceptions about Alma were different than they were of the Community College Delta where I taught, than they were of uh, U of M, and uh, than they were of uh, Michigan State. Um, if I had a stereotype that was, um, you know, substantiated, um, I wasn't more or less happy than if I had one that was unsubstantiated. For example, um, I was pretty at, pretty accurate with my stereotypes of what a community college would be like, and I was pretty much off base with what a small private liberal arts school with high tuition like Alma would be, and I was pretty far off on that um, with Adrian. And uh, even though there are some sort of depressing reasons for my stereotype at the community college, um, maybe my um, experience was a little bit more depressing than that for the age range. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, well, try to analogize with the Richard Sherman thing. Richard Sherman does this thing. I'm not surprised by that. Mm -hmm. He does that. Um, that's his culture. When I went to Delta, I was not surprised by the outcomes that I experienced. If Tom Brady was to rape and kill his wife, I'd be surprised by that. It'd be kind of a letdown. So when I went to Delta, things panned out how I expected. Half the students didn't even show up for the last class, and I didn't fail. When I went to Adrian, because of all those factors that I mentioned, small liberal arts, high tuition, etc., I set the bar really high, like Tom Brady. You know, they didn't really hit that bar, so I was kind of thinking about that. My assumptions were far off. There's multiple factors, as there is with any sociological study. Um, you can't focus on one factor. So it wasn't just the fact that it was aging. A lot of stuff that's due. There were a lot of athletes in season. The class was a night class, six to nine. So if you missed one class, you missed. 10% of the semester. Um, no sociology majors. No really kidding. Everyone started. More from the text. This is about teaching. I think this is a good segue because what I did at Adrian, I was way too relaxed in the beginning. And I I would I should know better because I come in here relaxed with my joke and my practical joke that I did with the beer. Um, so this, from the text, the teacher starts out tough. The first day, the teacher lets the students know who's boss. If you start up, off tough, then you can kind of ease up later, but you have to get that first impression on 
and for a lot of America, that was the first impression of Richard Sherman. Um, what about you? Do your professors start off tough on the first day? Did anyone pull a practical joke like me? How do your professors um, come across on the first day? What's that first impression? And have they changed you then? Or first impressions yet? Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, business from class, um, you're just kind of blunt, and like, he's like, all right, he's like, you know, I don't believe in Third grade, he's like, I hate a bunch of crap. Like, so I just do straight scale of grading. So if you fail, you fail. I'm just like, oh. Sorry, he was just sarcastic. Sorry. <laughs> did he really say crap to you? Very blunt. Um, and why did he do that? Um, I think he just wanted us to like, um, like kind of enforce, like, take it serious and. Conversely, I started with a little bit of a practical joke involving beer, or the pretend beer, um, and uh, started pretty uh, relaxed, and um, then. I think I start to pick stuff, pick, pick up the pace of class and try to present stuff to you um, at a fast pace, high level, teach you all like grad students, where um, I began with this practical joke. So my approach is different than his. And according to the text, his approach is better. You should start tough. You should come in like a big dog and bark at the, at the students and um, then ease off later. Whereas if you come in sort of soft, um, then later you try to pick it up. You shouldn't be surprised when students are all scared. Why isn't he just coming in with beer every week? Like it's, we actually have to learn stuff now. So I think I should probably change up my delivery. <laughs> sure. Come in me. I don't like to come in me. <laughs> uh, but that seems to work. Every Most professors do that. Does anyone else have a professor that starts slow and then picked it up? Or do your professors start with a bark and then kind of take them? So you're one English teacher. She came in and said that uh, she's one of us. She on like first name basis. She's like, I'm a big nerd, I'm a geek, and all this kind of stuff. Like putting herself down, kind of. And she's like, I like to crack jokes also. So she went and looked at that, that funny aspect, trying to be our friend rather than straight up, I'm your professor, and he's all from. What's she like now? Okay. Okay. I think for like the upper level sciences, like especially chemistry classes, like the first two weeks will always be review. So it's like you're saying, they're like, oh my god, I already know all this, I don't need to do this. And then that next week you're just like, oh my god, I don't understand any of this shit. So it's mostly like the material that does that to you, but the professor doesn't help you at all. Like it doesn't like help the situation. They just do you think sociology is also difficult to grasp because the material is real life stuff? You don't think that's difficult? I think so, that's very hard. It's, you think it makes it easier? You have more of a connection with it, but it plays a bigger role in your life than some of the other stuff. Like chemistry, you're learning this for like a job kind of stuff, or for a profession or whatever. But Stuff that like sociology is based off government and what's happening nowadays and that kind of stuff with people in their life. So I mean, it plays a bigger role in our lives. So when we talk about me and how I act and your other professors and how they act and Richard Sherman and how he acted and Aaron Andrews' response and then the negative people on Twitter and how they reacted and your interactions at McDonald's or with your dad or at the bar. Does it all make sense that we're talking about Goffman's presentation of self? I mean, it's a very basic sort of discussion, but it, I really hope that when we leave the class, you're not just like, we talked about Richard Sherman. I hope you think, like, we talked about how our behaviors are responsive, that we, have, we come with predetermined responses, that when somebody jokes with us, we're supposed to act one way, if somebody comes hot, after a football game, we're supposed to act another way. The presentation of ourself is not necessarily determined by our own volition. Maybe it's totally based on our cultures. There are a lot of factors that come into play. 
with how we interact with each other. Does collected mean not himself? Yes. This is this is exactly the point. This is exactly the point. And for example, what happened with you? Uh, your boyfriend gave a guy money, and the guy didn't give back the right change. There's a different interaction than if two friends, you go out to a lunch with your friend, and you give your friend a five, and you're like, can I get my five back? And your friend gives you back a dollar, and you're like, no, I gave you a five. It's going to be a totally different interaction um, with a bouncer and a dude at a bar than it is going to be with you and your friend at, in the lunch line in the afternoon. Because there's a power, there's power there, power difference. There's also a role difference. There's a more of a conflict based on the role of the bouncer and his whole role is to bounce people. And your friend's role is not to bounce people, so there's probably going to be less conflict because there's two different actors on that stage. And the performances will be different by each of those actors. It's going to be more cordial. It's going to be more aggressive. <clears throat> Perceive the, the perception of the audience. Um, let, let me make this comparison then and see what your thoughts are. Um, hopefully some of the talk that hasn't talked yet about um, Richard Sherman. Do you think that uh, Richard Sherman's behavior is more or less calculated than Tom Brady or Peyton Manning's behavior? More or less calculated. Any thoughts? What about my behavior? Is my behavior more or less calculated in this class than your behavior? Any thoughts on that? Predetermined, on purpose, intentional, conscious versus unconscious or subconscious. Any of those? How so? So much so that I read some <laughs> I read some uh, information on hand gestures today. There are certain hand gestures you can use. <laughs> True. I think ours is more reactive too. Like even if yours isn't like totally calculated, um, like you're not following a super strict lecture like some other professors do. Um, like you're allowing us to have a reaction to some of the things that you're presenting rather than you just presenting like rigid lecture. So it's calculated to be uncalculated. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Do you have a question? Is like yours just more? It is like predetermined because you know what you have to cover and that kind of stuff. So you know from what point to what point you're going to be going while we basically have to sit here. Like you allow us to voice our opinions and our views 
but we know which ones you're really looking for, which will be the physical I made the slides and I know the material well, and I'm trying to get out of you what I want to get out of you. So is your behavior, has it been manipulated by me? So I've basically created your lines for the past 60 minutes. That's scary. I don't want that much power. Well, I also think that like you have to react to how you react to you. So like, if what you're saying isn't really registering with us, you have to find a new way of saying it. So it's kind of calculated, but you have to kind of base it off of like how you react and the things that you say at the time. And where does my um, the, the way I kind of adjust, I guess, my behavior, where does that skill come from? Or why do I do that? How am I able to adjust? There's one word I'm looking for. Okay, I just say, um, yes. Can you put that into one word? Yes. 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 You all get A's. Because that was what our first three weeks were about, too, right? Like, my behavior, what I'm doing is based on my experience. I'm trying to manipulate your experience, and your reaction to me is based on your experience. And that, that's the whole point of this week's reading. That's the whole point of Goffman's presentation itself, is that it's this sort of philosophical debate, and we go back and forth that we just did in the last 90 seconds, which is, I came ready to try to manipulate your behavior. And then you kind of agree with me that I was manipulating your behavior. But I was only manipulating your behavior to respond to me in ways that you already knew how to. So we haven't really solved anything. I'm, that's the whole point of this class. Like, I think... <laughs> Sometimes people have a hard time with sociology, too, because um, you always got to remember there's no answers in the back of the book. And it's not our intention here to like solve things. But we need to be able to look at things differently. And you need to be able to analyze real life <laughs> a little bit differently. So that when you see Richard Sherman, you can respond a little bit differently than had you not had this class. And in, in your real life and in your real jobs, you can see things differently than before. So I hope that all clicked a little bit. We can talk about that forever. That was fun. Really got you. Maybe. I always get a kick out of getting some cool things. Um, that whole circular thing. When you get to a place where there's not an answer, you got to a good place. If I just keep feeding you questions and you give me these predetermined answers, like math class, like that's gosh, what good is that? No offense to math, sorry. Stop looking on stuff. Okay. Math. Math is cool. We don't have bridges without math. Alright. Keeping up with the progress of the course. What are we doing next week? The syllabus says that we're reading a chapter on McDonald's. Perry, Joseph Perry, can you tell me what chapter McDonald's is in your text? For me, it's uh, 43, I guess. Oh, so they kept that at the end, huh? They, don't want, to, they want to front load Goffman, but not McDonald's. So we have a chapter about McDonald's next week. Um, I was going to do a field trip to McDonald's, but it's way too cool. So we're just going to have to push that off. That's not to say that we won't do a field trip. I love the field trip. We just probably shouldn't do it next week when Paul Vortes is hitting us in the face. Um, so we'll probably do a field trip. It'll probably be to the coffee shop and not McDonald's. It will integrate ethnography. I have not read McDonald's chapter yet. So I don't know if it contains ethnographic references or not. But I'll bring up ethno ethnography. Um, which is a sociological method, and you will bring your reading of the McDonald's chapter, as will I. And at some point next week, presenters with the last names A, B, or C have to present some stuff. So who's here? Last name is A, B, or C. 
One, two, three, four. So you got a percent. Um, what? McDonald's? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in a Big Mac. Chicken. Chicken. I won't eat it. I haven't eaten McDonald's or fast food in three years. Chicken? What are you going to bring in chicken for? A lot of chicken. Chicken. Chicken McNuggets. Have you ever, uh, you know about pink slime? I don't care. Hopefully I'm going to 40%. 40 Setting the bar high. <laughs> So I, yeah, I've given you what five uh, different lecture styles. I think two had or two or three had the camera. One had a fake six pack of beer. This one was taped on the uh, Google with uh, the slides. I think did this type of time slides uh, twice from right like there. Mm -hmm. You got a group activity. You could bring in a chicken apparently. Um, So when I present, I try to present the theories. Um, I try to throw in a lot of vocab words. Like this week it was like role, uh, tradition, um, so basically the same vocab words that get tied them up. Yeah, the reading, the reading should be good. Yeah. Should be good. Enough. This whole presentation was off Gotham. I can make semesters worth of presentations on each section. So I don't think it will be too hard to make a half hour presentation on one chapter. And you should work together too. Who is it? You? 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 No. Is it you? You, you, you. you. Four of you. You should work together. These classes are so easy. I told you that, no, I mean time wise, not material wise, time wise. My last, I've never, I've always taught three-hour classes. Has anyone here, here had a three-hour class? Had a How did you like those? Mm -hmm. You watch 20 documentaries? <laughs> <laughs> Three hour labs where it got me to transfer out of Michigan State. I can take that. I want to kill a pig. What's this say? Take attendance and high five each other? My favorite slide. A AJ! Who's AJ? All right, AJ. Oh, yeah, because you guys are presenting. Allison. Yeah. Allison, you're presenting. Yep. Joshua. Yep, because you're presenting. This is this is good. And uh, Marie. Mari. Mari. Mari, Mari, Mari. I went to high school with Mari. Marnie. Marnie. Uh, Alicia. Abby. Yeah. Abby. Logan. Where? Logan. Nice shirt. Mary. Aaron. Huff. Max. Max. Scott. Kids Miller. Scott. Jose. Oh, this sits over there, not here. Jose? No? Jose, man. Jordan. Jordan. Rachel. Rachel. Ted. Ted. I thought that was beer that you had like at first, like a forty. <laughs> I don't, and I don't. Not to give you any ideas, but I don't have a sense of smell, so I will never know what's inside of there. Um, Kristen Pollock, Kristen, Joseph, Joe, Joe, Joseph, Joe, Harry, Alberto. Remind me of somebody I went to college with. Named Tony. 
Dakota. Dakota. Aaron, Shana, Allison Smith. Ely Dong Tai. Ely Dong? It's too cold, right? Caitlin? Caitlin. Connor? Connor? Connor. Connor. J. 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 Billy? Billy? Look like a friend from high school, too. Named Matt. Justine. Cool. I guess we'll high five. I'll read your papers. Sure, they're great. No matter. It's great to you, you'll get a 10. Because it's culturally relative. That's grade relativism. I think I need to set my slides to 90 seconds. I'll get better. <laughs> there could be less slides. This is something I learned in like my first semester of teaching. Nobody has staplers. It's great. That's not a bad thing. I'm just saying this is very common. No staplers. Fascinating. Why would you need a stapler? You need a hotel. They're so pointy. Yeah, some teachers take off. It's like all the space on my desk. A stapler. I use it like once a year. Wow. Yeah. Max. Rachel.